right. Well, today, in honour of the Festival of Diwali, I've titled this message, Light My Way. (laughs) And um, (laughs) I'm going to be speaking about the one true light, this word. This word. Because who knows, we all need to have our way lit up before us. The Bible says that we can stumble, that we stumble around in darkness without the light of God's Word. And that was certainly the experience in my life. And so you get to know me. So I'm hoping we become friends and maybe Ryan and Rachel will invite me back. I thought I'd better tell you a little bit about myself so you know me. Uh, You know, I'm married to Tim and we pastor the church in the city. We have three boys. But I wasn't always like the epitome of the Christian life. In fact, I wasn't raised in a Christian family at all. My dad was famous for certain types of spirits and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. He was the local bottle shop owner. And um, I didn't know about Jesus. Surprising in Australia. I'd kind of heard about him, but I didn't know about him. I was 14 and in a high school scripture class, Christian studies class, and I heard them preach the gospel that Jesus Christ was, is the Son of God. He died for your sins, and if you put your faith in him, you can have a relationship with your Father in heaven and live eternally with God. And my heart just resonated with that message, and I just knew that was the truth. And so at that moment, I kind of yielded my heart to the gospel and took myself along to a small little church. But I was a fiery young woman. I had a bit of a fierce spirit myself. I was ambitious. I wanted to be a lawyer since about the age of two. And so I kind of, I was going to church a little bit, but I was really studying hard, working hard, made it into law school at Sydney University, I thought that was my dreams come true. I, in fact, found out it was the beginning of a path of darkness and destruction as I was walking away from God to pursue my own dreams. I didn't realise it, but as my dreams, my ambitions became bigger than Jesus, my life went into a greater place of darkness. And so at university, I got involved in various different relationships, caught up in lots of different things. I got to the end of university. I graduated with honours in my law degree. And I thought, okay, this is meant to be it, but it's not it. I'd just broken up from yet another relationship. I'd kind of graduated, yet I had this darkness and this emptiness and this despair on the inside of me. I thought to myself, all right, something's wrong here. What do I need to do? Okay, maybe I need to do some good works. And I hitchhiked pretty much. Do you know what hitchhiking is here? Yeah. Okay, sort of. I kind of caught public transport, but let's just make the story more exciting. (laughs) Um, No. I did catch a ride at one stage of the journey, so it's not completely lying. Um, But I made my way on my own across Australia to Western Australia, actually, where these guys are from, to volunteer for six weeks in the Aboriginal Legal Service, thinking this is going to satisfy me, this is going to fix the problem. But it didn't. I came back across Australia very lost, very empty, very confused. At that point, I went to College of Law, which is the practical training before you enter the workforce. And at that place, I met a Christian. I was astounded. I thought everyone was a Christian just until high school and then stopped. But here was a Christian. I was amazed. Here was a Christian at the age of 23. And she preached the gospel to me. And I thought, oh, This is fascinating. And so I thought, all right, well, this is one thing I've kind of left behind for seven years. Maybe it's time to actually start looking at the Lord again, start thanking God for what I've got instead of looking for, you know, the random answer to life. And so I took myself along to a little church and it was okay, nothing special. But that same day I was at a deserted beach. It was the middle of winter. 
I went for a swim, you know, trying to like wash my problems away. <laughs> and I came up the beach and there was a young girl that I'd known from school. And I, she said, how are you, Kiralee? And I said to her, I'm actually not great. And she said, what's wrong? I said, I just feel like I've lost my spirit. And she said, oh, that's amazing. Can I read something to you? I became a Christian two months ago and she opened up the Bible to me. And I'm like, that's so weird. I went to church for the first time in seven years this morning. And, and then it all started to happen. The next day I bumped into an old teacher who just basically said to me straight out, Kiralee, you've been looking for all the answers in the world, but only your father, your good, good father in heaven has the answers for your life. And then I went to a movie and I sat beside another old school teacher who was a Christian and it was like the Lord was like, I've had enough of this girl living in sin, trying to find her own way. Enough's enough. Let's swoop her up back into the Father's love. And so at that point I was 24 and there was no turning back. The passion of God's pursuit of me was undeniable through the people he sent into my life. The difference between the depths and the depravity that I had plummeted to and the sense of clarity, peace and joy and light in my life was so remarkable that there was no possible way I could ever turn back. And so I graduated. I did fulfill my dreams of working as a lawyer. I worked as a criminal lawyer for a year and then as a children's solicitor representing kids who had committed crimes and I loved that. But actually the call of God came upon my life to minister his word and I answered that call and I took myself off to Bible college and that's where I met Tim who's thinking I've heard this story a hundred times. <laughs> Wake up, honey. <laughs> um, that's where I met Tim. And, you know, you kind of have heard the rest of the story. So that's just a little bit of a snippet of my story. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For you have died and your true life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that beautiful, church? Your true life is hidden in Christ with God. I was pursuing a life. I was pursuing what I thought was a life. But my true life, God's life for me, was hidden in Jesus. And you know what the Lord showed me? Shortly after coming to him, after coming into relationship with him, I was sitting one day in the presence of the Holy Spirit and I saw in heaven shelves and shelves of photo albums of my life, all the days of my life that the Lord had prepared for me, stored up in heaven, my true life hidden with Christ in God. So I had this incredible encounter This moment of great light, like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, this dramatic turnaround. But I found that doesn't last the whole distance. And we need light every day to guide our way. We need revelation light every day to guide our way. Sometimes we think, I've met Jesus, I'm transformed. Why don't I just know what to do? Why why isn't everything sorted out? Why is this going wrong? Why don't I just have the answers? It's not meant to work like that. The Lord doesn't want you to have it all figured out because then you won't need him. He wants us to be in relationship with him and his word every day, finding light through his presence and his word so he can light our way. King David, this incredible man of God who knew the presence of the Lord as a shepherd boy on the mountaintops on his own, tending to the sheep, but also in the palaces as a king leading the nation of Israel. He knew the extremes of knowing God and yet he cried out in Psalm 119. And I'm going to read it to you. Oh my gosh, I have to use reading glasses these days. It's absolutely outrageous. Okay, if I didn't have jet lag, I might be able to get away without using them, but here we go. All right, so, (laughs) okay, (laughs) 
So he cried out. He wrote this incredible psalm in Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter of the whole Bible. All right, it must be important. If you've never read it, go home and read it. It will ignite a fire in your heart for God's word, for his Bible. It's a stunning psalm. And he wrote this psalm and he said in verse 9, he said, how can a young person live a clean life? And is that not our cry? How can we live a right life, God? How can we live a clean life? How can we be guided to live right by your standards? King David asked the same question and he answered it. He said, by carefully reading the map of your word, by carefully reading the map of your word, I'm single-minded in pursuit of you. Don't let me miss the road signs you've posted. You see, church, the Lord has posted road signs individually for every one of you. But we need to have our head in the map. We need to have our head in his word. And I'm going to talk about in this message how to read this word. Because there's a way to read the word and to come into relationship with the word of God. King David also said in the same Psalm, verse 19, I am a stranger and a temporary resident on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. Isn't that beautiful? I'm a stranger on this earth. That's the truth for every one of us. We're a stranger and a temporary resident on this earth. That's why we feel so alien at times. That's why things just don't work out as we imagine at times. We're a stranger and temporary resident on this earth. His kingdom, the kingdom of Christ is not of this earth. Our true home is in heaven. And so on this earth, we need his commandments, his word to light up our way. Okay, so even Jesus, even Jesus, the very son of God, didn't have it like all sorted the moment he was born onto the earth. He said, I can only do on this earth what I see my father doing. His walk on the earth was activated by a regular daily relationship with his father in heaven. As he connected with his father and saw what his father was doing, he knew how to walk each day. Jesus, the son of God, also said, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Church, we go so hungry without the words proceeding from the mouth of God. So hungry. Our hearts can be so dry and parched without having the seeds of his word planted on the inside of us. Deep in our hearts deep in our hearts. So this word, if Jesus needed it, if King David needed it, then we also need it. Amen? Amen. All right. So how do we hook up to the word? How do we kind of get into it? And I think it's important that we understand this because for me, when I became passionate about the things of God and started to feel the call of God I chose to just devour this word and I didn't have a lot of skills or knowledge and some of the word would be digested wrongly. I couldn't digest it. I'd get like indigestion trying to eat the word. It was too harsh. It wasn't going down properly. So there's some basic principles that I want to teach this morning about the word of God so we can all be taking a hold of his word to light up our way. Okay, the first, well, first, it needs to be digested daily, just like food. If we don't eat it every day, we will get malnourished and we will go hungry. The Word of God needs to be digested daily. All right, that wasn't actually my first point, that was sort of like an introduction. My first point, because they're probably going to come up on the screens and I'll confuse you. Okay, the first point is to read the Bible with the Holy Spirit as a guide. The Bible is not meant to be read without God's Spirit. It's a spiritual book. And if we don't read it, 
in prayer and in relationship with the Holy Spirit, we can take it so wrong. And, you know, throughout the ages, people have misused the Word of God, pulled different sections of the Word of God and used it wrongly. And so we need to be careful and we need to be in a spirit of prayer when we need the Word of God. It's a good thing to pray before you read the Word. Holy Spirit, lead me as I read your Word today. Guide me, speak to me what you want to speak to me from your word. And you'll often find you might read one passage and there's just one line, one sentence that really jumps out to you. And often that's what the Lord is speaking to you. Now, there's some characteristics of the word of God. When when the Lord brings his word to us, it will always come with a spirit of faith, hope and love. So if you're reading the Word of God and you're feeling condemnation, shame or disgrace, there's a different spirit attaching itself to that Word. And that's why we need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be the one to bring the Word to us because the Word will bring freedom. It won't chain us up. It will not chain us up with religion. It will bring freedom when we read it with the Holy Spirit. We need to read the word with the Holy Spirit as our guide. We need to pray. My second point Okay, my second point is the word is to be read in community. Who knows that our greatest meals happen together? Our greatest meals of the Word of God happen together in church, in community. We digest best when we're with a body of believers all digesting the Word of the Lord together, helping each other understand it, discussing it with each other. We digest it best as a family. And you know, the awesome thing about reading the Word of God in community is when you're in community, adults who are more skilled in the Word of God, they can cook it up for you, they can cut it up for you. And for the babies that are brand new that will choke on a full-blown steak, right, the more seasoned adults that have been around for ages, they can cook up that Word, they can cut up that steak and they can feed it to you so you can digest it properly. And we grow in the Word of God in community. We go from babies who have the meal fully mashed in the blender, you know, fully blended, spoon to us. We grow from that. We go from the blended food to the chopped up food to the full meal. And then finally, the Lord calls us to cook it ourselves. Finally, as we grow up as adult believers, he says, all right, now learn to take from the raw ingredients. Go straight to my word and learn to cook it up for others. We digest the word in community church. You know, it's interesting in the early church, they didn't even have the written Bible as such. They were relying on different letters and different teachings. Obviously, they had the Old Testament and the letters that Paul was writing, but it was mainly the preaching that was coming from the pulpit. They were digesting it together in church as the body of Christ, just like you and I today. It's very cool. All right, my third point is you can intake the word in many different ways. You can sit down and you can just read straight from the Bible. You can go through book after book. You could go through chapter after chapter of the Psalms. You know, there's so many different study guides you can get. You can get the word into you by listening to preaching. These days there's so much brilliant preaching available through podcasts and Ryan and Rachel can refer you to great preachers who are going to build faith and strength into your spirit. You can get it from great books that are based on the Word of God and have got the Word of God in them. There's many ways to get the Word of God into you. I just say it doesn't so much matter how you do it. Just get it in there. Eat, eat your food. But, you know, your primary, your primary way as a growing Christian is to be in his house, eating it together with other believers. My fourth point about the Word of God is to always mix God's word with faith. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, the writer 
wrote, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Isn't that so sad? There was a whole group there who had the word preached to them, but they didn't mix it with faith. For the word of God to be effective in our life, for it to accomplish that which the Lord has sent it out for, we need to mix it with faith, with believing it, with believing the word, with believing what God has said. That can be a fight. The Bible says that we fight the fight of faith, but it's a good fight. It is a good fight that will reap an eternal harvest. And the last point about the word of God from James 1.22 is to apply the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so as we hear the word of God, as we meditate on God's word, as we talk to each other about God's word, we also need to begin to apply God's word. So whatever it is that you're hearing each week, maybe it was the offering message this morning about tithing. Maybe it was a salvation message a week or two ago where you learnt about surrendering your life to Christ. Maybe God has challenged you about kindness to others or a standard of living or lifting your standards of living. Whatever it is, As we apply the word, that's where it really begins to have power in our life. Why don't we all stand? I want to close with praying this morning. I want to pray this morning. I I want to open up the altar soon for anyone that feels dry in your spirit really dry in your spirit and I sent it says people here this morning that do feel dry and you know the word of God yes it lights up our way and yes it guides us but David also said my earthly life clings to the dust revive me O Lord according to your word my earthly life clings to the dust revive me O Lord according to your word And so in a moment, I'm going to pray for people who feel like their earthly life is clinging to the dust. There is a revival anointing here. There's a spirit of awakening here to awaken your hearts, to bring rivers of refreshing upon your heart. But before we do that, I want to extend an invitation for those of us here that may never have received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. And so as everyone across the room bows our head and closes our eyes in a spirit of prayer towards God, I'd like to issue an invitation. If you've never received Jesus Christ as the Lord, the Bible says that Jesus said when he was on the earth, I am the way, I am the truth and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The Bible also says that we can struggle in the disordered mess of our own humanity. But Christ entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity to take our struggles and sins upon him. That we may be cleansed, that we may be given a new life that we may be set free and given eternal life with our Father who is in heaven. So as every eye is closed and every head is bowed here this morning, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and you're feeling his invitation to receive him today, I'd love you just to slip up your hand so I can see it. Just a little wave. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, honey. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So beautiful. There is no, there's not any more stunning invitation, thank you, sir, than the invitation of Jesus Christ to connect with him. He asks nothing of us. 
accept our life as it is, raw, beautiful, messy and struggling. He loves us with a never-ending love and longs to connect with us. If you've known Jesus before, but like me as a young woman, you've got confused and travelled other pathways, pursued other things, but you're feeling the touch, the call of the Lord to come back with a strong decision of commitment today, I'd also love you to slip up your hand so I can pray with you after the service. If you're feeling now is the time, no more chasing my own ways, no more following my own dreams without God. It's time for a strong commitment. Please lift up your hand. Thank you, honey. Thank you, sir. And finally, if you have, thank you, sweetheart, if you have fear or uncertainty in your heart about eternity, I believe it breaks the heart of God to see humanity living in fear. I believe he longs to give us assurance. The Bible says he gives his Holy Spirit as a signature ring, a promise of our eternal salvation. And if you're seeking that assurance today to be set free of fear, terror and confusion, and walk in the strength and knowledge of salvation, I'd also love you to slip up your hand. Wonderful. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. All right. This is what we're going to do now, church. We're going to worship the Lord. And those of you who raised your hand, I'd love you to come forward. You're coming to meet with Christ. There's something powerful about coming down the front of an altar at the church. It's giving yourself as a living sacrifice. And I want you to just stand here on this altar and we're going to pray with you. Thanks, guys.